Devin Bell with CT Digital Photography Magazine. I and Rocky Nook. I am here today with Daryl Young. We may have a couple of other people pop in uh, momentarily, but we're running a bit late, so we wanted to get things started because Daryl actually has a lot to share today, so we're looking forward to it. Really quick, I'm going to introduce you to the magazine if you're not familiar with it. Uh, my favorite customer quote from last week was CT Digital Photography, the world's best photography magazine that you've probably never heard of. So here is our issue eight. It is on newsstands right now, and it will be available through next month, and issue nine comes out in September. So that is our issue eight. We do four issues a year. You can get an annual subscription for $49.95. And uh, our website is uh, ct-digiphoto.com. Um, I'm also here with uh, Rocky Nook, who co-publishes the magazine. They do digital photography books, and Daryl is one of our authors. Hello, everyone. Daryl, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more and uh, tell us maybe about your website, and, and then we'll start talking about your books. Okay. Well, I'm a uh, photographer and author from uh, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee area. You can probably tell by my thick Tennessee accent where I'm located. <laughs> and basically, uh, I have uh, written several books for Myconians.org. I'm associated with them and I'm an author for, for several years now. I've been writing books for uh, the Nikon users, various camera type manuals. And recently I've written another book called Beyond Point and Shoot for those that are coming over from the point and shoot world. And so I'm glad to be here to hang out with everyone today. I've been a photographer about, uh, about 1968. My mother gave me a Browning Hawkeye camera and got me started on this trip that we've all, we're all taking right now. So glad to be with everybody. Sorry about that. Um, we're really happy to have you here, Daryl. Thank you so much. Um, Daryl has done quite a few books for Rocky Nook. Several um, of the are Mastering the Nikon series, uh, which is also done in association with uh, the Nikonians organization. And um, published not long ago, in April of 2012, was his book, Beyond Point and Shoot. Subtitle, Learning to Use a Digital SLR or Interchangeable Lens Camera. So this was his latest book, published in April of 2012. Daryl, why don't you talk, us a little talk to us a little bit about um, that book. Um, it's been getting really good reviews on Amazon.com. I think it's got eight five-star reviews, which is pretty awesome. Well done, you. Um, you are used to writing these heavy-duty manuals. Right. So how did this book come about? Well, this book came about uh, directly because of my sister, Kenny. <laughs> she uh, had been a photographer for many years and shot with a point-and-shoot camera, as many of us began with. I did myself in 1968. And uh, she had been looking at my photographs, and I would taken some images down by the lake and blurred the background nicely for the portraits, and she wanted to know how to do that. And so I talked to her about lenses and different types of cameras. And so she decided she wanted to leave the point-and-shoot world and get a DSLR. Hey, there's Mike. Hey, guys. Hi, Mike. How are you? you? Good to see you. Brought my camera. Hey, that's a good <laughs> idea. I, I brought mine, too. Look here, my little buddy. Woohoo! Nice on the 800. <laughs> we were talking about my book a little bit, Mike. Good. But anyway, I was talking about my sister, Tammy, and she... Uh, he basically decided to move into the DSLR world. And that's a pretty complex world in compared to the point-and-shoot cameras, you know, where you just press the button and the camera does the rest. And so uh, I basically went uh, looking for a book for her. I gave her one of my books that was based on a camera like her. She bought a Nikon D3100, and I'd written a book on the D3000, which was pretty close. So I gave her that book. And... Um, she used that book for a while, but was having some difficulty with the terminology in the book. 
And I thought, wait, what's going on here? Because people say my books are really easy to read. And I realized at that point that uh, my sister did not know the language of photography. And so coming from a point-and-shoot world, she didn't know what an aperture was or a shutter speed, uh, ISO sensitivity setting. And so not knowing those terms makes it very difficult to read a book that use those terms a lot. So I said, well, let me find a book for you, Tammy, that will start from the very beginning and assume you know nothing and see what we can find. And I went looking in bookstores and online and found several nice books that have, uh, you know, beginners in mind, but it seemed like many of them started kind of assuming that the photographer already had some knowledge of, of the basics. And I could not find a book that absolutely started at the very beginning with no knowledge whatsoever of photography and explained every term that you came up with. You know, what is a sense? That sort of thing. And so I basically uh, started writing some notes down for her, and she was able to understand my notes. Uh, the notes get, uh, got more extensive as I went along, and uh, I gave it, uh, some of those notes to a professional photographer friend or two who gave it to their family to try out, and they came back with suggestions and ideas. And so basically those notes ended up being a book. And so it started with my, my sister's quest for knowledge of DSLRs and turned into a book. And what's different about this book is that it assumes absolutely no knowledge on the part of the user. Mm -hmm. and that's critical for somebody that's coming over from the point shoot world. And so what my book does is it any time a new term is introduced, it explains how that what that term means right then. And only then does it go on and tell how to use it. And so the person learns the language of photography as they're reading the book. And it covers important things like how to use the shutter, the aperture, the ISO sensitivity, what a sensor is, how a camera works, what's the difference between a DSLR and an interchangeable lens camera, or a CSC or e camera, as they call them. And so it's just a very easy to understand book, an excellent introduction to photography. It takes you out of the point-and-shoot world and brings you into the enthusiast world. And so far, people are really enjoying it. I'm getting a lot of good reports back on it that people understand it well. Mm -hmm. so hopefully, it'll do well. Yeah, you know, the, the reviews on Amazon have been great. You know, all the reviews that have gotten. I have a copy of this at home. <laughs> um, I've said it once, I've said it before. I'm learning. Um, or I've said it before, I'll say it again. I'm learning. <laughs> Obviously, I'm learning how to talk to you. Um, so, yeah, uh, the Beyond Point and Shoot book is uh, doing well, and people seem to like it. So we're glad that you stepped away from your monster manuals to uh, bring us this book uh, so that more people can start learning, you know, basically kind of, not necessarily at the bottom up, but, you know, eventually we'll all learn how to be photographers like you guys. <laughs> That's the yeah, goal. Well, the book, as Daryl said, the book is needed. I teach a lot of workshops too, and you know, a lot of people bring their bigger cameras, but um, I get lots of people on our trips who bring a spouse along on the trip who doesn't bring their big, their big D800 or even mm -hmm. D300, and they have a point and shoot, and they want to learn more, but they're a little bit nervous about, like Daryl said, the terminology. So it's a great, it's a great. Uh, topic for the book, and I hope it does help you, Daryl. Well, I appreciate that. Mark Kellner of the Washington Times reviewed the book, and uh, he wrote an article about it, and about some photography ideas, and he said that the, uh, the book's explanation of the uh, mirrorless cameras alone was worth the uh, price of the book. Yeah. That's an interesting side, side effect of that book. I really didn't intend that to be the case, but it, it worked out that way. Just describing how the book, how the cameras work and so forth. Yeah, good deal. <laughs> Great. All right, just so everybody can be reminded, um, Beyond Point and Shoot, Daryl's book. This is great for if you yourself are is someone that is moving into the SLRs and just starting to learn, or if you've got a family member who is envious of your photography skills and you don't have the time or the patience to teach them, yeah. Daryl can. <laughs> so uh, this book is available on the Rocky Nook website as well as on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. The Rocky Nook website is uh, rockynook.com. 
Um, moving on, talking about monster manuals. <laughs> uh, word on the street is that the Nikon mastering the Nikon D800 manual was almost 600 pages. That's what I'm hearing. The camera, <laughs> the camera certainly deserves a manual that large. It's incredibly complex and full featured. Uh, not that it's hard to use. It's just so many settings. And mm -hmm. uh, they came out with like 36 new features in the camera above the D700. Mm -hmm. And so it's just really a massive camera. It can do anything you ever wanted to do with a camera. <laughs> Don't you agree, Mike? Oh, yeah. I love it. I've, uh, you know, like Daryl, I, I don't know if I should say unfortunately or fortunately, <laughs> but we buy all these cameras because that's what we do. And uh, so I bought the D800 here a few months back, and it has been the only camera I've been using uh, wow. for the last three months. And like Daryl says, it'll do just about everything. Uh, the resolution in this camera is out of this world, and uh, every day I use it, I'm just more and more impressed with it. So Nikon just knocked it out of the park with this camera. How many, just out of curiosity, <laughs> how many camera bodies do you have? Well, I think I probably have owned everything Nikon's made since 1980. <laughs> I usually end up... I usually end up uh, doing a book or something and then selling the camera. The, one that I, the ones that I keep are my favorites. I kept my F5, my D2X, and this little baby will never leave my possession. <laughs> <laughs> this is a medium format camera. Medium yeah. format is back. And I am so excited about this because, I mean, I used to carry an RB67. If you've ever played with one of those monsters, you know what it's like to carry one around the field with several backs and everything and the lenses. Well, this thing does better quality work. You look at the size of it, you know? Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I don't have as much as uh, Daryl uh, has. He's got me beat there with quantity of cameras. But I think right, right. now I've, <laughs> I've got, uh, I guess, seven or eight in my possession. They're all digital. I don't know. I have a, I have a film camera still. I still have a film camera still. <laughs> what? Yeah. Good old film. Yeah, good old film. Great. Well, um, Daryl, you seem pretty excited about your D800, your new baby. Yes. I know that you have mul many children of your own, <laughs> but uh, this is this is children. This is child number seven, isn't it? As far as uh, the books go, I think it's number eight or nine, actually. Number eight. Right. The eighth book that I wrote. But uh, as far as the camera itself goes, um, seven. I have been amazed at this camera. It's, an, it's a working camera. It's made for a professional, although an amateur, which means I love photography, or a, a semi-pro, an enthusiast, can use this camera as well as uh, a pro can. It's, it's got excellent settings for, for individuals that are just learning photography. But it's really designed for somebody that's working with their camera. And uh, like I mentioned, medium format, it's mm -hmm. back. It's big enough to do images that you can crop very well, very effectively. And I have some examples of that. Uh, it's significantly faster in my experience. If you've worked with a D7000 or a mm -hmm. D300S camera, D300, in an event setting, uh, it just it outruns those cameras. It's faster. Uh, it handles the SB900 flash or 910 or even the smaller flashes, extremely mm -hmm. well. I've never seen a camera light a scene so well with one flash, and I've got examples I can show you with that, too. And uh, just I've used it in nature settings, event settings. I've shot weddings with it. I've shot graduation ceremonies. And this yeah. camera can do it all. Now, the, the only uh, slow point is if you're shooting, you know, high-speed sports, it's only four frames per second, so that's its limitation. But other than extreme... Extreme sports or extreme wildlife movement, it can handle anything you throw at it. Mm -hmm. This is from personal experience. I've thrown a lot at it in the last several months. Well, Mike, didn't you do a test with, uh, was it your daughter's soccer game? Yeah, I just wrote a blog post a few weeks back about using the D800 for sports and action. And like Daryl says, I mean, this is not what it's designed to do. It, it definitely doesn't. But you know, it will shoot four frames per second. And that's, I mean, you go back in the in years in digital uh, life, you know, four frames per second is nothing too terrible. So you can shoot sports. You just, you're not going to compete with, like, the D4 
or even sure. the D3S cameras. But yeah, on my blog, I've got a bunch of photos I took at a at a track event, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I'll actually impressed with the camera. You know, its autofocus system is just ripped right out of the D4, and it's it's uh, great autofocus, so it has no problem tracking. You just have to be really good about timing timing your shots, you know, for the peak of action, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it does great for sports. And then, you know, another great thing about it is you can kind of crop wide. You know, you don't have to shoot really tight. You can crop wide and then crop it down. Uh, frame right wide is what I'm trying to say. Frame it wide mm -hmm. and then crop it down later in Photoshop and pull out a lot of detail. So, right. Um, Actually, Daryl, you've got an example of that, don't you? Yeah, I've got a couple of examples. Let me see if I can share my screen here. And, uh, okay, can you see that window? Yeah. Okay, now this is a, a picture of the, when I first got the camera, the first day I went down to a cemetery and I just set it up on a tripod. I wanted to see what kind of detail I could pull from the distance. And you see the point of this arrow right here. These tombstones are literally dots. I'm probably 500 feet or more away from these tombstones. And if you'll look, this is 100% only. This is not a blow-up. This is 100% view. You can read the dates. and It's hard to see it probably on your screen, mm -hmm. but you can read the dates and the names on this tombstone 500 feet away. This is, we're talking about amazing cropping ability. This is, this is better than anything I've ever used before, to tell you the truth, even a 4x5 camera, because you don't run into the grain that you'd have in a film camera. If you see right here, there's like a little pole here. There's detailed information on that. Another user uh, cropped this same picture. I put this up to, on the Internet for people to download and try out. And he was able to read dates and all that information from right in this area of the, of the picture. Wow. It's mere dots on the screen. Now here, this next image, Now this is taken with a 400 millimeter lens. Hmm. Now this is an example of cropping. Can you see the moon shot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, this was the day of the super moon a few weeks back. And I just went out in the yard with my uh, 80 to 400 millimeter and uh, shot a picture of the moon. This is a 1,200 pixel crop out of the middle of that image. Now, 1,200 pixels is, of course, not real big. This is not an enlargement. This is just a crop. So this gives you an idea of what you can do with this camera. 1,200 pixels can be used on the web easily. It can be used in print. And if I did any enlargements at all on this picture, this is a completely usable image. Yeah. But that's with a 400 millimeter lens. Now that's amazing to me, the detail that's in this image. Look at that detail. I wish you could see it like I see it on my screen. It just blows my mind. The D800 is an incredible camera. Now, as far as cropping ability goes, now just, can I tell you a few more things about it? Yeah, of course. We had talked about um, the event shooting, and I've got some shots just to give you an idea about a working photographer's view of it. Now, this is a picture taken from probably 25 feet away with an SB900 single flash. Hi, Brenda. <laughs> That's my wife, Brenda, on the left, and this is one of the graduates. And this, this picture, uh, if you look in this area, you can't see it here, but I mean, if I zoom in, I can read the text like a book on this little diploma. And uh, this is a picture from probably 30, 25, 30 feet away, zoomed in with a, an SB900. Mm -hmm. And look at the lighting, the coverage, and the spread of that camera and that flash unit combination. It's beautiful. And uh, I mean, I to tell you the truth, when I, when I shot with this, I was also shooting with the D300S. I carry two cameras with me. And I could not light the scene as well with the D300S using an SB800. By any means, of course, the SB900, as Mike knows and can tell you better than I can, is an advanced flash with, with beam width controls, and I was able to use that more effectively. But this camera just simply does a marvelous job for working photographers. Now, here's an example of a wedding I shot. And I, this is after the wedding. The day's about gone. The sun is below the horizon, and I went out with the camera. And there's a little catch light in their eyes. that did a little bit of field flash photography on this. And this shows you the quality. Look at her dress, the details there. Look at the dynamic range that's available in this image. You can see the darkness in the leaves behind. You can see detail in her dress. And this is a, this is a flash shot using direct flash as a fill in fill flash, BL mode, balanced fill flash mode. 
but uh, it's got a little catch light in there. That's a beautiful image. I wish you could see these full size on the screen. They're just wonderfully sharp and usable. Yeah, Daryl, that uh, that wedding shot there, uh, really great balance with the ambient light and with the flash. Nice yeah. job. Nice job. Yeah, Mike is the flash expert. You've got to get his book if you don't have it. What's the name of your book again, Mike? Called uh, The Nikon Creative Lighting System by Rocky Nook, of course. <laughs> Well, I've got his book, and I really enjoy it, Mike's book. It's, a, it's an excellent introduction to Nikon Creative Lighting System CLS, and it also uh, shows you how to set all the different flash units up, the SB910, SB900, 700, 600. I think, does it cover any other flash? The, R, the R200 also, doesn't it, Mike? Uh, yeah, the R1C one, the, the macro kit. Okay. Yeah. If you want to use speed lights in multiple groups, You've got to get Mike's book, honestly. I've, I've got the thing that really has helped me a lot. And I thought I knew Flash until I read Mike's book. <laughs> oh, shucks. I speak highly about that. So really. <laughs> that's that's also Daryl. <laughs> it's also a Rocky Nook book, too. Now, here is an example image to show dynamic range. Uh, the, you know, uh, DxO Labs rated the D800 sensor as the widest dynamic range ever created in a sensor in a normal production camera. I think it was, what, 14.4 EV? Yeah. And this is a perfect example of what it's talking about. You can see into the woods on this picture. You can see the bright water. Uh, you can see the entire environment. This was shot on an overcast day because I didn't want excessive contrast. But nevertheless, there was plenty of contrast. If you look right here on this image, there's a little cave area that you can go into, and you can see that black area goes into the cave. But look here in this area, the darkness. This is really a dark area. The camera is pulling out probably more than I could see looking at it with my eyes because of the glare. And so I've got bright water and, and dark areas. So this shows the dynamic range. This is a base, almost an unretouched shot. Hmm. I, did, I did a little bit of uh, probably color saturation on this, and I may have added a little contrast to it which would tend to lower the dynamic range <laughs> a little bit. So this is really, to me, an amazing, an amazing thing, what this camera can do with dynamic range. I love, I love some of your nature shots, Daryl. I All like right. that one. That's my forte. I really enjoy the nature of shooting. It's uh, something that is a great pleasure to me. I take a lot of interest in it. So I think I'm back there. Let's see. Let me unshare my screen. You're back. Am I back? Okay. But um, basically, that's uh, if, you're, if you're a working photographer, you absolutely must have a D800. I think Mike would agree. And if you ever try one, I don't think you'll be able to go back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm a Canon user. You're a Canon user? Well, a lot of Canon users are switching nowadays. Because this thing's video. We've not even talked about video. The video... This camera will do something that's never been available to my knowledge before in a DSLR. It does uncompressed, clean video output. And you have to remove the camera cards. That's a tip, by the way. If you're going to record to an external device, remove the camera's memory cards first. Okay. okay. And it will, it, will output un, it will output streaming video uncompressed, uh, clean with no overlays from the camera, and it's broadcast quality. And this thing could be used in television production, movie productions, and a lot of people are switching to this camera just to get that video mode. It's amazing what it's capable of doing. I just walk around. I'm, I'm not a heavy video guy, but I've walked around with this camera just hand-holding it, you know, shooting video. And I, and I really, you know, the, the, the rolling shutter effect is relatively well controlled. It's better than any camera I've used so far. And uh, if you know what a rolling shutter effect is, so jelly wobbles, they call it. Not a whole lot of that. As long as you don't slam the camera around, it doesn't shake around. You know, it should make the image look weird. Hue and wobble, I think they call it. Is that a southern term? <laughs> Jelly wobble? Jelly wobbles, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a new dance. It's, but it's a marvelous, it's a marvelous camera. And in, in my book that I, that I wrote on the thing, I didn't know. Do you have one of my D800 books there? Uh, well, you can have the book itself, I don't think. Let me. Uh, do you mind if I show a picture of it? No, go ahead. Okay, let's see. Uh, now there's the book, and it's like uh, Devin was talking about, like my other books. It's available on uh, Amazon, RockyNook.com, 
Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble, and various other bookstores. But it's uh, this is probably the biggest book that I've ever written. The Mastering the Nikon D7000 was my, my book before the Beyond Point and Shoot. That camera was 496 pages. The book is that that big. This one's going to be probably pushing 600 pages. I understand. Yeah, I asked Jocelyn. <laughs> I, I held back. I held back. It's I, supposed I, to be going to print in a week. Yeah, it goes to print. And I'm just now doing the index, finishing the index on it. Uh, right. right Got to move on. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be available, I think, it's uh, a release date is August the 28th. And so hopefully it'll be out before that if we can get it printed. Good. Yes. Getting it printed is key. Very helpful for a book. <laughs> well, it will also be available in ebook formats, uh, I think, around the middle of September. Sure. And so if you prefer ebook, it'll be available in just about all the formats through O'Reilly Media. Sure. Um, so you had mentioned that removing the, what did you say, is it the memory card? Memory card. Video? Yes. Uh, what are some other tricks or little tips or kind of aha moments that you had with the camera that made it different than other Nikons that you've used? Well, not so much different. I'd like to give you a couple of tips, and some of them apply to other, other Nikons, but this is something that a lot of people have written me about. So I didn't know the camera could do that on other books, and I wanted to bring this up. If you go to your custom setting menu and go to custom setting F12, Okay, multi-selector center button after F12, and you have a playback mode. So the path is uh, custom setting F12, multi-selector center button, playback mode. Mm -hmm. If you set that to view histograms, then any time that you're previewing an image on your monitor on the back, you can press the multi-selector center button and it will pop up in a histogram for that. So you don't have to scroll up or down, you know, and go through the various screens. And a lot of people don't know that exists. And it's, see, Mike, Mike's showing it there. I wish Got it? It's F3, Daryl. F3? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> now, check, check. now, I'm looking on, look at, uh, F, look at F12. F12 says reverse indicators. Uh-oh. Okay, let me... Got to be accurate here, so... Let's see, multi-selector, no. Oh, F2. I think you mean F2, multi-selector center button, F2. Uh, well, well, you know, it's not much difference between 12 and 2. Yeah, I know, just a, <laughs> just a 1. Just that multi pesky 1. Multi-selector center button is F2, I'm sorry. There we go. And uh, you have shooting mode, and then you can uh, go under playback mode and view histograms. Yep. And they're kind of hard to see, I guess. Yeah, it's not focusing. But that's, yeah. Yeah, that's a real good tip. But if, you, if you'll put your histogram up, I'm, I'm all about using histograms because it really helps you to uh, validate your exposures very well. And my books all talk about histograms a lot, but I really believe in using the histogram. It's good to have that there so you can, when you take a picture, you can chimp it or look at it, and then you can press the multi selected center button and get a histogram immediately. It's a luminance histogram. And so you'll be able to see exactly how well that's exposed and make adjustments without losing your shot. Mm -hmm. And then another one is uh, custom setting D4. And I'm going to look now before I commit to it. <laughs> custom setting know, we don't have to make any edits in the book, do we? <laughs> no. This, this is something I prepared right before we started today. So I wrote down 12 instead of 2. Obviously. I'm not going to have to go through all 600 pages with whiteout. No. <laughs> and uh, the exposure delay mode is something that a lot of people are aware, are aware of, but this camera has improved upon the exposure delay mode to the point now that I'm very rarely using any type of a uh, cable release or external release because it now is available with one, two, and three second shutter delays. And three seconds is significant. If you're on a tripod and you release your shutter with your uh, shutter release button, the camera will wait three seconds before it fires the shutter, up to three seconds. And that's generally enough time to even use your finger to release the shutter. And where this was like a half a second or one second in previous cameras, 
They've extended one, two, or three seconds, and this is extremely useful to me as a nature photographer. I can go out now and just mash the shutter release button and step back. And three seconds later, the shutter will fire without vibration, except for the shutter itself. And you can, I've, I've even got that in, in my menu. If you're familiar with my menu, it's on the, the Nikon. You can put most your most used functions under my menu. And so that's right there. So that I can turn it on and off at will. That's a couple of tips. It's F2 for getting your histogram. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say, Mike? You're making faces there. No, I was going to say, yeah, I was going to say secret. F2, right? F2. Yeah. Custom setting F2 and custom setting uh, D4. Look into those and set those up on your camera. You'll have some fun with it. There's plenty of, there's plenty of tips. This camera is so complex uh, that it's, uh, you could study for months on it and find all kinds of goodies in there. They're all in my book, though. <laughs> Right. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Mike, have you, uh, you yourself found anything worthwhile to share as far as? Well, yeah, um, with uh, Daryl's uh, point there on the D2, I use that when, um, you know, the, the camera has four different banks that you can set up. And so I set up one bank as kind of my nature and landscape bank, and, and I'll use that, um, that shooting delay mode for the mirror lockup function. What it does, like Daryl said, you push it, you push the shutter release down, it locks the mirror up, and then three seconds later it drops the mirror to take the photo. It's really great for stable. Um, one of the cool things that I like about the camera is the, um, the live view now is switchable between photo mode and movie mode. And um, it's pretty cool because you can set up your movie settings Let's say I'm doing a, uh, a movie and I want to set the shutter speed and aperture, let's just say at f8 and uh, a 30th of a second. Well, in movie mode, the camera will remember those settings, and then I can go back, right back to photo mode and go right back to whatever my photo shutter speed and apertures are. So they're separated, whereas in the past with like a D300S, I'd have to go, okay, now I'm in doing movies, I have to mm -hmm. set my shutter speed and aperture, make all those changes. Now I'm doing photos, I have to go back. Now with the D D800, they're separate. It's very efficient, so I'm liking the efficiency of the camera. Nikon's done just a great job of making the camera just much more um, user-friendly, I guess. Um, also, we have a, a separate record video record button here up on top, uh, separate from anything else on the camera, which makes it much easier to initiate the video. So. Yeah, Nikon did a wonderful job with the video aspect, and I'm using that more and more. Um, one, one more thing that I would comment on is uh, Nikon added a fourth button up here on to, to the top of the camera. Um, now we have a bracketing button back on cool. our smaller bodied cameras. And like, is there, what was that, Daryl? I'm so happy about that. Yeah, see, on the camera like the D7, the D70, the D90, they actually had a bracketing button on the side, but with the higher end cameras like the D700, the D300, Nikon took that bracketing button away. Well, finally they brought it back, and it, what a great, what a great tool for us. Uh, I do tons of HDR photography, and uh, I'm using that button every single day. So thanks for bringing it back, Nikon. Yeah, I, I appreciate that too, for especially for a nature photographer when you're bracketing images uh, to get the maximum dynamic range. HDR photography, that's a very useful feature. And one other thing that I wanted to mention, and Mike kind of touched on it, you set your, your little mode selector to the bottom for the uh, movie live view mode. Uh, your camera also can take pictures, still pictures in that mode. But the interesting and neat thing about the pictures, they're different in that they're 16 by 9 in size. And it kind of, it's like a crop out of the middle of the big FX sensor. But what's neat about that is if you're going to display a bunch of images on a uh, HD monitor, HD uh, TV that has a 16 by 9 ratio, they pretty much fit that ratio. And some tablets have the 16 by 9, 16 by 10 ratio. I don't think the iPad does, but some of the others like the Android tablets do. And so if you're shooting a lot of pictures that you're displaying on an HD monitor on your uh, computer mm -hmm. or on um, an HD TV, that 16 by 9 ratio is a very useful ratio. It's still like a 25 megapixel image, I think it is, yeah. in that mode. 
So that's kind of a neat thing. If you want to do still photography in movie live view mode. <laughs> yeah, works. some of my uh, – hey, Daryl, do, does all of your software um, – Will it manage that 16 to 9 ratio raw file? I've had some issues with some of my software recognizing the raw file that I took in video mode. Hmm. Have, you, uh, have you seen any of that? No, I've not seen that at all. I don't think um, raw files really, did they even maintain? Yeah, oh. it, it did. Well, I'm not able to see it in a couple of my software products, and so it, you know, the, their software is always a few months behind of the cameras, and so I'm just waiting for the next iterations on some of the software so I can see those new aspect ratio raw files. It says file not supported. Oh, I so see what you're saying. I see yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of compatibility issues right now. I think even Nikon Transfer. That's a, another tip I would like to mention. Mm -hmm. If you're using Nikon Transfer 1.5.3 which was a standalone Nikon transfer, uh, that particular program has a, a bug in it to a degree. I talked to Nikon about this, and they didn't even know about it when I first got my camera. And it will report your RAW files as being like 1,600 wide. Mm. Uh, so do not use Nikon transfer 1.5.3. It works sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't. And then you've got a file that's not really in very good shape at the other end of it. So the key is use Nikon View NX to transfer, Nikon View NX2. It has a big transfer button now on the uh, on the menu. And that opens up a, a, a new version of Nikon transfer that's built into Nikon View NX. And View NX is included with your camera, and you can also download it free from Nikon's site, NikonUSA.com. But um, that's the safest way to transfer files if you're just getting a D800. Don't use that 1.5.3. But you may come to grief with that. Lots to talk about. We could go on for several more hours if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have some more time if you had any other things that you wanted to add. Um, uh, so it's up to you. Daryl, can you share? Are you able to share my screen? Or who's, who's sharing screens? Devin? I can use uh, Yeah, that's, that'd be me. Okay, so let me um, let me show you a couple shots that I've shown uh, took here with my D800. All right, Did that come up? Yeah. All right, cool. So uh, last week, actually, or maybe ten days ago now, I took a uh, family road trip, and uh, we went all throughout Washington, Oregon, uh, Nevada, and California, with a couple stops in Yellowstone or Yosemite and uh, San Francisco. So I took my D800 and uh, just had a ball shooting with it for the whole week. So this is a this is of the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, this is on the, the city side, on the San Francisco side. I went underneath the bridge and uh, propped the camera up on a chain link fence that was preventing me from getting as close as I wanted to get. And I uh, rattled off uh, seven shots in a bracket. There you go. This is the D800, of course. And then uh, I processed this in NIC HDR FX Pro version 2. I was a beta tester for NIC on this new software. And, uh, and then I converted it to black and white in NIC uh, Silver FX Pro version 2. So really happy with the D800 file. And as Daryl mentioned, the dynamic range on this camera is astounding. And the truth is I probably could have almost got the same image from one shot just by right. pushing pixels around in Photoshop and Lightroom. So really impressive with that. Um, you have any other pictures? Oh, look yeah. at that. Here's another one. This is in Yellowstone. I'm sorry. Why do I keep seeing Yellowstone? Yosemite. <laughs> and uh, this was underneath uh, uh, Bridalville Falls. And here I was out hiking with my kids through the stream. We were hopping boulders, and I brought along a... Uh, Joby Gorillapod focus, and so I put the camera down real close to the water with the Gorillapod and took the D800, and this is a single shot. I'd say it's about one second long exposure, maybe a second and a half, about F16, and uh, just, as you know, you can see really far into the shadows. This is, a, I don't know if you can, it's hard to see on these small screens, but like Daryl said, there's just tons of detail there that I never would have got, even on my D700 last year. So 
real happy with that. Here's a shot in San Francisco, right over by Lombard, and uh, this place is called Lombard Place. It's just they're just apartments, mm -hmm. and I thought it was a very interesting shot. So again, using that bracket button, I uh, took a seven frame bracket for this one, handheld, and then uh, pieced it together in Nick HDR Effects Pro, and then converted it to black and white in Nick Silver Effects Pro. So three shots. And I've got thousands more from last week's trip that came out just as well, but really pleased with the camera. And it's it's just changing my photography. I can use these photos. I can blow them up to a wall-sized print now with no problem. So nice. loving it. I love the angle that you got on the Golden Gate. I don't think I've ever actually seen that perspective on the bridge. Yeah, I've shared this photo on you know Google Plus and Facebook and my my blog and I've received that comment from tons of people. A lot of people saying, hey, we've never seen that perspective. So that's yeah. cool. That is a very interesting shot. I enjoy that. <laughs> Thank All you. All right. Back. <laughs> <laughs> All sure. right. Well, um, unless you guys can think of anything else that you'd want to share with our viewers, um, I think we'll probably wrap it up. Um, Mike, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, where people can find you and your stuff. I had mentioned that you were with uh, Nikonians Academy. Yeah. And I run two companies. I run uh, Nikonians Academy, and we run photo workshops and photo adventure trips all around the world. You can find our website, www.nikonianscademy.com. And then I also run my own company, uh, where I'm an author and do all kinds of other fun stuff at Visual Adventures. And so our website is visadventures.com. Cool. Thank okay. you. Daryl, um, where can people track you down other than in Tennessee? <laughs> <laughs> Come to the Smokies and go find me there. Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, Pictureandpin.com. I'm a writer and a photographer, so pictureandpin.com. Great. And that's easy to find. And uh, Daryl's D800 book is coming out next month. If you have a D800, I would highly suggest checking it out. You'll get to learn all the nooks and crannies of your new baby. Um, his Beyond Point and Shoot is currently available on the Rocky Nook website and uh, the other places we mentioned. Uh, like I said, this uh, interview and segment was brought to you by CT Digital Photography Magazine and Rocky Nook. Again, this is our issue eight. If you'd like to subscribe right now is a good time. Um, you'll get five issues for the price of four now through the end of July. Our website again is ct-digiphoto.com. And I think that does it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. May I comment briefly on the magazine? Hey, is only if it's good. Oh, it's good. <laughs> I, uh, I look I'll mute you if it's negative. <laughs> <laughs> now, the magazine is amazing. I really, in my opinion, CT Digital Photography Magazine is the absolute best enthusiast magazine ever written. And I've subscribed to pretty much every photography magazine out there. And when the, this particular magazine comes in, it's not one you just sit down and, you know, leaf through. You know, this is a, a magazine that you sit down in a comfortable chair with a cup of coffee, and it's more like reading a book. Each of the articles are, you know, it averages like 20 pages long on the articles. None of these two or three articles, you know, two or three page articles with lots of advertisements mixed all in to get you to jump around. It's just, it's a very, very deep and thorough magazine. And uh, to me, uh, I, I don't, you know, I really enjoy this this magazine more than anything I've ever read. I, I really feel strongly about that. If people will try it, you can pick it up on newsstands. I see it at uh, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, various mm -hmm. places. But try it out. Pick up a copy of this magazine. You know, it, uh, for, for what you're paying for, fifty dollars a year for four issues may sound like a lot, but no, it's not. You'll put this book on your shelf and collect it. This is a book. It really is. This, this is these, are, these are books that cover in extreme detail the subject they're covering. 
so that you can use them as reference manuals in the future. It's very unlike anything I've ever read before in a magazine. I, I recommend it. Thank you Jer very much, Daryl. Um, we are happy to have you guys as part of our uh, online family. Uh, both uh, Daryl and Mike write articles for our social media pages, uh, specifically Facebook and Google Plus. So we're, we're really happy to have these talented guys on board. And if you join us over on Facebook, uh, you'll get to see more articles over there. Uh, you can also you know, obviously join us here on Google Plus. We'll try and post them here as well. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that does it. Thank you, Daryl, for that wonderful plug. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me on today. I've enjoyed this a great deal. All right, good. All right, guys. We'll have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you next time around. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good, good to see you, Mike. Likewise, Daryl. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.